let's start this over from the top. What is, unfortunately, uh, the most talked about thing in the MHA fanbase? If your answer is ships, then congratulations, you have eyes and a brain, which coincidentally makes you smarter than most people in the fanbase, but uh, I digress, because while shipping is only made as poignant and stable because of MHA's larger cast, that same cast kind of sucks. Izuku and Ochako, for instance, are the two main characters in the series. Their stories are intertwined by the desire to protect others, and the joy that lies at the end of disavowing self-hatred. Her character is a commentary on the archetypical girl character who's just there for support, taken to its extreme by literally being someone who can only support. She's not a fighter, and she doesn't even really want to be a hero for the same explosive and testosterone-stunted reasons as her classmates, wanting to simply help her family and make them happy. Furthermore, her desire to support people is extended to antagonists, not just protagonists, literally cultivating in her being willing to support a villain who just needs a second chance at a better life. But, but that's lame, right? Like, that's just an excuse? She states multiple times in the series she's going to be proactive, she's going to be a driving force in the story, and yet she's barely in this story. It's not her fault, she's in a shonen battle manga and can't do shonen or battle, so she's left behind by the origin trio, or the newest arc's useless class 1A character. She's for all intents and purposes the Megami of the My Hero verse, but at least when Megami was a total cunt while ignoring the feelings of those around him, it was intentional. That's like half the reason why her relationship with Izuku can't work because there is no relationship. Sure, the story can have a bunch of exam arcs around the students, the students can make up songs for a concert, we got like two chapters of Aoyama and Deku dicking around about cheese, but god forbid Deku ever talked to the first person to never discriminate against him. This problem isn't specific to her, by the way. Uh, Ochako suffers just like the villains suffer, for instance. As the story goes on, they go from complicated, traumatized individuals who just want a society that accepts them, even if they have to destroy the current one to get it, to victims with voices literally silenced or characterized by being evil from the day they were born. This is a story first and foremost about how discrimination can tear a society apart, a society that's already built on heavy bystander syndrome, and yet the story's consistent answer to these dark issues is just to be kind. But what does be kind even mean in the face of coming from a family of abuse, an abuse that made you feel trapped and lonely while everyone else stood by satisfied in their own delusional security? or in the face of being shunned away by your loved ones because they were afraid of you, disgusted by a child, or when your reason for existence is ripped away from you because of your father's desire to be the best, and you have to see that same father praised on TV for the rest of your life. Class 1A as a group is not built to respond to these issues. UA as a school does not produce students that are built to respond to these issues, which is what makes Deku and his specific inner circle such outliers. And yet, even though the series is so intent on persuading the audience, at least early on, that the total destruction of Hero Society wouldn't be so bad, the same Hero Society represented through Class 1A is still here. You guys like my blank background? What is the most talked about thing in the Bleach fanbase? You see, a common talking point in response to Bleach criticism would be a variant of You just didn't understand it, etc, etc, while also suggesting a reread. Listen, I am all for Kubology. Five hours is nothing to me after a gram of edibles. But if you're not interested in Bleach on a surface level, why would you go out of your way to explore the themes and symbolism? Hollows early on are presented as ghosts with unfinished business. They were humans who died with either regrets, repressed traumas, or held down by those in the world of the living still holding on to them. Soul Reapers not only restore balance to the world of the living, but also help lost souls enter Soul Society, a place of paradise and peace. However, after Soul Society, the shift from Hollows is seen via the Arankars, and especially this Aspadas. In the Arankar saga, we're greeted with Hollows that have bridged the gap between Hollow and Soul Reaper, thanks to the final boss Aizen. A lot of what makes the Espadas and Aizen amazing is dumped deep under symbolism, parallels, and subtext. 
and Bleach does not do a good enough job of not only establishing these characters on the surface level, enough for me to want to dig deeper into them, but it also seems like the manga thinks this way of storytelling is superior to convention. Okiora's character and how it was paced is probably my biggest example of this. Don't get me wrong, Orihime is the perfect character to address the sensitivity of a soul, the kindness that comes from having a heart, and what ideals come from believing in the people around you. However, his character isn't emphasized enough until he dies, and that backstory that tells us of his sorrow is locked away in external content. Same with Aizen, the antagonist of over a third of Bleach, also without a backstory or clear motivation before his actions, before his demise, and I would argue Yuhaba. Uh, however, the issues with his character lie actually above the subtext. The beginning of the story is so focused on establishing the fact that these lost souls not only need, but deserve a peaceful transition into paradise. What does that paradise look like? Well, if you were hoping to one day meet your family in the afterlife, you can forget about that. Families get separated as soon as they enter, and there are some who straight up spend a millennia trying to find them, but soul society is too freaking big. There's also a class system, with the same Shinigami tasked with balancing the universe at the center of it. The Soul Reapers not only prop up this conservative and archaic society, they're also all really terrible people, and most of the character arcs in Thousand Year Blood War are all about them not changing their ways, but indulging in their worst tendencies and staying stagnant in their toxicity. And Yuhaba actually approves of this, like his people nearly got wiped out centuries ago, and the Quincy's fundamentally disagree with the way Soul Reapers go about their business with Hollows. However, Yuhaba isn't bothered by any of that. His reason for hating Yamamoto and his gang of fascists is that they're not fascist enough. They fell off. They used to be really passionate and bloodthirsty and cold-hearted individuals. Now they've grown soft. What the f*** does that mean, Kobe Bryant? Deku's character very much reflects the journey of his author, someone who after many failed attempts at serialization, looked at MHA as his last chance to make it. In the same way, the world guides Deku into accepting that he might not be fit for his dream as his instincts take over and his body moves on his own for one last hurrah. To him, he deserves nothing, accomplishes nothing, and his entire being is nearly a vessel for the safety and happiness of others. This is toxic. Sure, self-sacrifice is heroic, but there should be a balance of commitment while understanding that you're not the only one who wants to protect the ones you love. Those same people who love you back want to protect you too. This is something both Izuku and Ichigo need to realize, that their desire to protect others shouldn't come at the cost of their desire to love themselves. And they do, kind of. At the end of the Arankar saga, Ichigo learns his hollow self and old man Zengetsu are the same person, both facets of the same soul, and then it's through accepting both of those sides that he's able to win against Aizen, someone who in himself is uninterested in his own soul. But this is the problem. Ichigo, number one, retreads this arc of accepting himself again in the Thousand Year Blood War, except this time with the added retcon of him being a Quincy, which only complicates what was established before in the Ronkar. And number two, in the arc before the Thousand Year Blood War, the Fulbring arc, Ichigo reconciles with a soul society that fundamentally disagrees with his original disposition of being a rebellious delinquent who loved his friends and hated those who would try to hurt them, and he even starts to represent them, proudly proclaiming that he's a soul reaper and the bonds he made are more important than the atrocities these Shinigami have committed, especially towards those he loves. You would think a main character would have some sort of commentary to make about the state of the world and its politics, because they're the main character, but Ichigo is so far removed from his own story, I don't think he even knows what's going on half the time. Ichigo and Izuku live in a society that is unwilling to change, and I was waiting for the moment for them to finally address this and introspect about what that means for them. Kubo went through so much trouble in order to retcon Ichigo into being a Quincy, and I believe that him being a Quincy, the literal opposite of a Soul Reaper, would be important, and instead, him being a Quincy is only used as a plot device. Do the similarities ring true to anyone else? Deku can hang out with a bunch of terrorists, the father of his friend he knows has abused people, and he can have no input on any of it. 
he can hear out villains who have faced prejudice by society and have no response to that same prejudice, as if he never went through any of it. He can be friends with people who have in the past treated him terribly because of his quirklessness and not have any resentment. He's a minority in this world, but any interesting commentary that could come out of that is replaced by him just being an empathy machine. I have never been shy about my dislike for Deku as of late, but as baffling as it may be, any time we switch back to the Green Bastard in this godforsaken final arc, I was actually enjoying it. That trope of Deku saving someone and them saving him back has existed since Overhaul and it extends to Bakugo's return. The problem with his return, however, is that Deku never has the chance to have anything to himself and when the opportunity came to be the one on live television to save All Might, to destroy All for One, we instead have to give that to the spoiled rich kid who only recently learned that being a dick was bad. A moment that will be remembered for the rest of history is given to Bakugo while Izuku again is stuck on the sidelines. Every time I think Deku will take center stage in this story, he's either upstage by someone else, or in order to rush us to the finish line, his empathy is used as a plot device. Bakugo is simply a microcosm of the story never being willing to address what actually matters, and instead choosing to only hyperfocus on the story's themes of general and non-specific community and friendship. Because Horikoshi, the author, believes anything beyond that would be too gloomy and boring. Both stories have a conservative society that has led to the trauma, turmoil, and suffering of tons of lost souls. However, both seem so unwilling to address these inherent problems with that society head on, and as such, the characters seem a lot more shallow than they could be. And no, in case you were hoping or wondering, the main characters do not address these societal issues either. There's a poem called Be Not Defeated by the Rain. It's a beautiful poem describing a man on his last days who just wants to help everyone he can, even if those same people view him as useless. It doesn't matter what weather he's facing or trouble he might be enduring, he will discard that to help someone else. This is probably my western brain talking, but the entire time I read the poem, I just felt bad for the guy. Imagine you're someone with your own insecurities, traumas. The whole world has effectively bullied you and made you feel as if you were lesser, literally having to fight to justify the love others have for you. You break yourself, your own body, you risk your own life over and over again. You trade whatever angst and anguish you might have for a cold sense of duty to others. You hate yourself for others' sake. And yet, the world you're in, the story you're in, the narrative crafted around you, tells you that that's the right way to be. It shows that your self-sacrificial nature, to your own dismay, is the only thing keeping that same story going. The story that you're in says that your desire to protect others at the expense of yourself is unequivocally good. What a terrible worldview. And I sure hope there aren't any manga that have adopted it.